very thankful to have one of the greatest here with us today. Uh, he hails from Brooklyn, New York, and uh, he's a Hall Smith. Uh, he's a Naismith Hall of Famer. Uh, he, you know, he's one of the people that uh, a lot of us Carolina guys call the Godfather. Uh, he's done an outstanding job in his career as a coach. He's coached some of the greatest players in this world, but more importantly, he's been a steward in people's lives to help them become better men. Ladies and gentlemen, we have Carolina's great Larry Brown. Welcome to the coach. Thanks. Welcome to the show, coach. Thanks, Shimon. I, uh, I know before we got started, I was admiring your background. <laughs> um, wearing those jerseys mean a lot. Um, having that diploma in the middle there. Yes, sir. It all means a lot to you and your family, but especially Coach Smith. Yes. He's probably, he's probably smiling on us right now. Yeah. I'm sure yeah. that. So okay. I'm going to be careful to say the right thing so he won't be embarrassed by what I might, <laughs> might, yeah. might say. Well, that's, that's the one thing that, that we did learn about you guys and what made you such great coaches, but what made you more importantly great men. You were always selfless. And uh, – and you stood for something. And, um, you know, becoming a man, being 45 years old now, you know, I appreciated it then by more. I, I appreciate it even more now in, uh, in trying to emulate you guys. You know, that's, that's one thing that I try to do each and every day and how I carry myself and what I stand for within this game. And, and, and uh, you and Coach Smith have been some great examples uh, for us. And, uh, all of us can say that we're extremely thankful and grateful to have you, for sure. Well, whenever, whenever you mention me with Coach Smith, it's, uh, it's a blessing and it's something I'm really proud of. Yeah. Um, you know, I got lucky, Shaman. Coach Frank McGuire was at Carolina when I got recruited there. Actually, Coach McGuire recruited my mother. <laughs> and uh, she wanted me out of the East, and she felt comfortable with Coach McGuire. And about that time, Coach Smith left the Air Force Academy and joined Coach McGuire. Right. Um, and then in 1961, after Coach McGuire left, Coach Smith took over, and he didn't take over at the best time. You know, the basketball scandal was in 1961. Mm -hmm. Um the Grady University of North Carolina was punished. Um, we had only 16 games on our schedule the first year Coach Smith coached, 14 ACC games, and Kentucky and Indiana on the road. How about that beginning? Um, and right, then right, right. A, a few yeah. of our better players were ruled ineligible. And then the second year, you know, Billy Cunningham joined our team and – Billy was probably as good as any any player there wore that uniform. Mm -hmm. We had a really good year. Um, I think we were 15 and five. We only played 20 games. Um, and coach, you know, his he was restricted in the the areas he could recruit, the number of kids he could bring in. But he persevered. The uh, chancellor of the university loved him, respected his values. Um, and knew he cared about kids. And lo and behold, what he went over 870 games and changed the lives of all of us. And, you know, I, I played for a lot of great coaches, Shaman, I'm sure like you did. Um, and a lot of them impacted my life. I lost my dad when I was young. And, you know, coaches really impacted my life in a positive way. But nobody, I think, had a great influence than Coach Smith. Um, not only the basketball, because you and I know what a genius he was in terms of basketball and, you know, how he taught the game. Uh, his values were incredible about playing hard, playing unselfishly, you know, defending, sharing the ball, having fun. And I always used to tease him. I used to say, I write that on the board every day that I coach, but would you mind if – I said it'd be nice if we rebounded and defended, and he said, "Yeah, that that would be okay." But uh, but after you left, when you say to me you're 45 and have a family, 
And I'm sure not a day goes by that you don't think of something that had an impact on your life based on how he treated you and how he treated everybody else and how he expected us to act because it was a reflection on everybody that ever wore that uniform. So I'm really grateful for that. I think that's why uh, I never had a job in my life. You know, I did exactly what I wanted to do and yes, sir. never never went to work, just wanted to be around kids, smell the gym and share what he taught me. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, he's he's so influential, so influential. And, you know, earlier I uh, had an opportunity to speak with uh, Sam Perkins and, and, you know, things that he had to say about Coach Smith and things he said about you as well. Uh, when you recruited him when you were at UCLA. But before we go there, Coach, I know you said that your mother was recruited by Coach McGuire, but, you know, what What actually made you go to the University of North Carolina? What What brought you there? What was the things that enticed you to, to go to Chapel Hill? Well, my high school coach actually played baseball and basketball there. Okay. Um, and – one of our players, a kid named Billy Hathaway, a seven-footer, went there about four years or five years before I went. Yes, sir. Um, I, I wanted to stay home because if I stayed home, I would have gone to St. John's. They didn't have any dormitories, so we would have got a stipend for room and board, and I could have stayed at my home, my mom's house. Well, we didn't have a house, but I could have stayed with my mom and taken the train you know, into St. John's every day and, right. and make, make her life easier. But she, uh, she trusted Coach McGuire. He recruited almost entirely from the New York metropolitan area. Right. Um, you know, almost every kid wanted to go. And that was before we were allowed to recruit kids of color. You know, the yeah. ACC was not integrated. The SEC was not integrated. Um, most of the kids that I grew up playing with, you know, were black athletes um, and they were going to the Missouri Valley or the Big Ten, you know, and some of them even went out to the West Coast because they were very limited or they went to historical black colleges. Yes, um, and at that and at that time, historical black colleges were tremendous uh, because kids were de deprived of the opportunity to play in the ACC or the Southeastern Conference, Southwestern Conference to a degree. Um, and then when I went to Carolina, after I played a couple of years and played on the Olympic team, coach asked me to come back. Right. And, and I had the opportunity to be one of the, the people that recruited Charlie Scott, mm -hmm. who was, you know, the first black in the ACC South of the Mason Dixon line. Yes, sir. And Charles might have been one of the great players we ever had. And Coach just – his remark to me was, Charles deserves to be at North Carolina because he's a great human being, he's a great student, and he's a great player. And, again, at that time, you know, it wasn't like Coach was winning every year. Right. You know, like he did after, you know, Rusty Clark. Crew Bar, Burning, Larry Miller, that, you know, Joe Brown, Tuttle, that group, those yes, groups came in. When that happened, Shaman, you know, everybody wanted to play at Carolina. Right, 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 right. I mean, you guys really transcended the game. Um, and, you know, you, you know, recruiting Charlie Scott there, it, it, it changed the, you know, it changed the, the landscape of basketball, but more importantly, it, it changed the, the thought process of the university. And, uh, you know, you, co you and Coach Smith uh, recruiting Charlie uh, really opened the doors for all the other African-American athletes that, that followed. And so, you know, being visionaries like that, um, I think is, is something that has benefited you and Coach Smith a great deal in being, you know, such, such men that, hey, you're gonna stand for what's right. Um, you know, how, how were you able to, to use that when you became a, a head coach? Uh, you know, let's talk, talk to us about accepting your first head coaching job. 
Well, my first coaching job, you know, I played for Goodyear, played on the Olympic team. Coach brought me back to Carolina to coach. Um, that was when freshmen were ineligible. And the first recruiting class we had was Rusty Clark, Grubar, Bunny, Joe Brown, Gerald Tuttle. And that's the first group that ever won three straight ACC championships, three straight ACC tournament championships, and went to Final Four all three years. It's never been ha done again. Right. And I don't think it ever will. And unfortunately, that was the same time Lou Alcindor happened to be at UCLA. <laughs> right. But but really, yeah. Shaman, I didn't even ha have a clue that the ACC wasn't integrated. Never, never even entered my mind. Right. Um, but coach, coach, it entered coach's mind because, you know, the state was pretty diversified. You know, we had some unbelievable historical black colleges in, in that state. Yes. Um, John McClendon coached in that state, who was a mentor to me actually offered me my first coaching job at Kentucky State. Um, but Coach felt it was the right thing to do. And I was so lucky being there with John Lotz and Coach Smith. And he treated Charles like anybody else. And Charles fit into the student body. And it, it had to take a special person like Charles Scott to be the first one. Because it wasn't always easy for him. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I I was with Charles a lot during the first couple of years, um, and I didn't realize things that he was going through, things that he was subjected to. But he was a great student, a heck of a guy, and he really had the support of Coach and the whole administration. And like you said, look now, look at all the great, athletes that have gone through our program black white you name it mm -hmm. um, as long as you were a decent human being you wanted a quality edu education and you cared about playing the right way coach smith phil bill eddie roy they were going to recruit you and uh and i think the proudest thing that coach would probably tell everybody is you look at the families of the kids that have graduated and the success their families have had. Uh, I think that's what made Coach the most proud. He, he never talked to us about winning. Uh, that, that never even came up. It was all about treating your teammates with respect, respecting the university and acting the right way. And I, and I think now when we think about what's going on in our country, he'd be the foremost, most outspoken person in talking about how we need to do better. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think he'd probably make a hell of a president, to be honest with you. For sure. There's no doubt about that. You, you're, you're spot on with that. He, he would... He would most definitely be outspoken, and he most definitely could be the president of the United States. Uh, he was just that revered and loved. He was. But, yeah, but I, you, you're doing the Coach Smith to me, though, right now. <laughs> you're deflecting when we want to talk about you, Coach Brown. <laughs> right. That's how I can I tell. Would. Hey, hey, of the same cloth, man. That's the one thing that I really wish that I could have done. I wish that I could have had an opportunity to play for you. That's the one thing that if, if I, if there, there are many things that I would change about my playing career, uh, but I, I wish that um, the Lord would align me an opportunity to have played for you because I know it would have been like, Hey man, this is what I've been searching for ever since I left Carolina <laughs> in a coach uh, with the values and, and, you know, and just what you stand for as a man. Well, um, you know, if you look back on me, you, you had mentioned earlier how many great players I, I coached. Um, I had as many great coaches that sat next to me. Mm -hmm. um, and I learned from the greatest coaches of all time, not only Coach Smith and Coach McGuire and Mr. Iba and Alex Hannum 
and John McClendon and Pete Newell, I can go on and on. They all influenced me. Um, and I always felt like I fell short when you talk about those names and the people that I'm trying to teach and live up to what they meant to me. But basically my values, when I look back on all the things that really mattered in my life, it was all coming out of those people and primarily Coach Smith and what he taught us. Um, you know, I laugh when you said, boy, I, I love a to have played with you. you. You might have to speak to Raymond Felton and Chauncey Billups and some of the, you know, point guards that I coached and some of the things I expected them to do. Uh, but it was, it, it, it wasn't much different than what Coach Smith told me right. what I was supposed to do. You know, the, the, the thing, you could shoot the ball. You know, the, when you took a shot, the basket looked like a bathtub to you. <laughs> when I took a shot, the basket looked like a thimble to me. <laughs> so his idea for me, the way to help our team perform the best was to me to defend hard, to be totally unselfish, and to make sure I made everybody on our team better mm -hmm. on both ends of the court. Yeah. And that defined my role, which he was very clear about, you know, in his coaching. And I don't think enough people today are coaching kids that way. I think we're enabling kids yes, sir. to act a way that they normally wouldn't act if they were held accountable and had trust in the people that are coaching them. Shaman, think, think about this. When I grew up, my mom's whole goal was to get my brother and I through college. Mm -hmm. Now, my brother was a hell of a lot smarter than me, so academically, it was probably an easier way for avenue for him to get, get a scholarship to college, even right. though he's a good player. For me, my way of going to college, I had to get a scholarship. Yeah. And the best way I could get a scholarship was some athletic scholarship. Yes, sir. But my mom's whole life was to make our lives better. Now I see so many young kids, and I know you deal with some of the best players in the country. Some of these young kids that are playing now, they feel like their whole responsibility is to make their parents' lives better. I don't know if I could have handled that pressure. Right to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. And and I get nervous about it. And when I, you know, I watch AAU programs. When I first got back into college at SMU, AAU had taken off. And I heard horror stories about AAU. And then when I watched, I was, I was saying, no, that's not true. That's not right. There's a few AAU programs that aren't great, but the majority of them are great. They're giving kids an opportunity to be seen mm -hmm. by other colleges to have a chance to go on and get a degree. They get to travel where they never would have had that opportunity, stay in nice hotels, eat three meals a day, and play at a high level for some really, really quality role models. Right. So AU ball blew me away. I became a big fan of, of that. And then – now I look around, the thing that troubles me is these kids are impatient now, Shaman. Mm -hmm. They go to college without thinking about getting a degree. Coach Smith would never have allowed us to think that way. But if we were good enough to leave early, if we were going to be a lottery pick, he'd make sure you leave early. But he'd mm -hmm. also put it in your contract you gotta that you had back. to come back to Carolina and get a degree and you probably make more money because it was part of your contract. And right. I don't know very few kids that went to Carolina that you and I know left without a degree at some point and some left early. Mm -hmm. um, but that was total unselfishness on his part. You know, I, I think most of us who stayed at Carolina 
that was the best four years of your life. You know, <laughs> you, you could hardly beat that. But <laughs> if he felt you were ready for the NBA, he made you leave. But he also, like I said before, he made you realize once you're done playing, like you, Sherman, you're, you're 45. You're, you're just starting your career. But you've already impacted lives. And I think that's what would make him most most proud. And I think when I went back to coach with him, um, his whole goal for me was to try to make sure that I learned enough and cared enough that the kids that played for me, when they left us, were better human beings than when they got there. Right. And I think I fell short in a lot of ways. And, it's, you know, I know I'm talking too long, Shaman, but, no. you know, what's what's happening now, Shaman, with our country, I've called a lot of the kids that I've coached, especially the ones recently at SMU, and I asked them all, did I, did I say things that were offensive to you, or did I show you a lack of the kind of respect you deserve? Because it really worried me. Mm -hmm. Um because I know with Coach Smith and all the other coaches I played for, I never felt that any one of them was not somebody that really deeply cared about me. And I think that's why I love to coach so much. Yes, sir. Well, I, I can say this about you and never playing for you, but coaching against you while you were at SMU when I was at Tulane. If those kids ever thought that you didn't think about them, I remember the time – you and I were having a conversation in New Orleans about uh, the point guard, Nick. Right, Nick Moore. Nick Moore. And uh, we were having a conversation, and you said, well, Shimon, you should go and tell him that. And uh, I said, yes, sir, no problem. And I went out to the bus before you guys were leaving. I pulled him off the bus, and uh, I had a conversation with him. We spoke for about 20 minutes, and I let him know, you know, how I felt about you and – and, you know, just our conversation and how much you cared about it to, you know, so, you know, that you cared enough that you would have me go and speak to him to to try to give him some insight on, you know, what you were trying to help him accomplish as a as a person uh, beyond the athlete. And uh, I can remember later on in the year playing in the AAC championships, um, you guys weren't playing that night and we had finished and I was sitting in the stand scouting the next game. And he came, he came over and sat with me and he was like, man, I appreciate, I appreciate you talking to me about coach Brown. Um, you know, he said, you know, I just, I never looked at it that way and understood how important it was to have somebody like that. Um, because, you know, a lot of times the environment that we come from, you know, we, we're not, we're not interacting with a lot of Caucasian individuals. And so for some people, it's, it's difficult because you're placing your trust in people that, you know, maybe before you've encountered Coach Brown, you know, people have taken advantage of you or treated you a certain way. So there's that, that the apprehensiveness in, in an individual. So, um, you know, I, I think that young man, you know, especially after we had that conversation and I told him, Coach Brown, you know, gave me permission to come and talk to you. He wanted me to talk to you. I think, you know, that, that helped him understand like, hey, man, this guy is for me. Um, and, you know, a lot of times having some individuals there that can help people that have never been in that environment comprehend that environment is beneficial. And, um and uh, I know when you made that call to those guys that played for you at SMU, I know none of those guys felt that way because a lot of times, even when I see them now, um, and I see um, it's the big guy uh, played for you center. He's a assistant coach at Oklahoma State now. Um, yeah. Yeah, his, uh, <laughs> yeah, Cannon. His, his yeah. brother is going to be the number one pick in the draft, Cade. You know, yeah. I knew Cade since he was nine or ten years old. You know, you'd be yeah. proud of Nick. Nick graduated. You know, yes. he's player of the year in the conference, I think two years maybe. Yes. He just had twin twin boys, um, <laughs> his third child. 
he has three kids now in his household that are two years or under. Right. Uh, he played. He played in Italy, mm-hmm. um, two years. He played in France one year, and he's getting going. He's ready to go back. I just, um, I spoke to some people, you know, in Australia about him, but you know, his his twins were just born, so it, so he's not allowed to travel with them, and he's a little nervous about leaving his wife, you know, with such a young group of kids. But you know, it's. It's interesting that you said that because when I was growing up, I grew up in a community that was 90% white um, and 80% Jewish. I, you know, I'm, I happen to be Jewish, but yeah. my uh, my cousin ran the Bronzeville Boys Club in Brooklyn in Bedford Stuyvesant, and every mm-hmm. weekend I would go down to Brooklyn. And I'd play against kids that went to boys high school, Thomas Jefferson, you know, all those really great, you know, predominantly black schools. And I got my ass kicked every day. I mean, it was unbelievable because, you know, I was playing against kids that were playing at a really high level every single day, great athleticism. And at that time, you know, New York, Brooklyn, Long Island, that was probably the area in the country that was second to none. You know, there were as many great players coming out of that area. And at at that time, Shimon, we had St. John's, NYU, Manhattan, Seton Hall, you know, you name it, Fordham, every one of those teams you know, were really, really good because all the kids in the East had a tendency to stay at home. Yes, sir. And, uh, and then, you know, when we talk about, you know, I, I always look back, you know, I coach so many kids, um, and you hope you give them a chance to play at the highest level, to reach their potential, to put them in a situation where they'll be, be, be able to play the very best they can. And, you know, I know that's how Coach Smith, Coach McGuire, and all my coaches felt. But there's some that I still think in my mind, I wish I had a chance to do it over again. Really? You know, that maybe. Because uh, last thing I think we can talk about, when you were recruited by Coach, you were recruited by his whole staff. Mm-hmm. His whole staff knew all about you knew about your friends, knew about your family, knew about your guidance counselor, your high school coach. So when you come to Carolina, we all understand who you are as a person, and we could understand your behavior. You know, it it could be a little different because you grew up in a different area than going to a school that's predominantly white. When you're a pro coach, you know, you just draft a guy. Right. You don't know you don't know much about his background. You work you work fifty five guys out. You get to draft two of them. You have one little conversation with them, and their agent tells them all the answers that, that you know they're going to give you that they want it, want you to hear. Right. So you don't know. So you know, I I coached Allen Iverson, and I didn't know enough about Allen's background. I had read stuff about it. Right. But I didn't know enough about, you know, how he was brought up, how he, his mom had him before she, she was 16. And I knew about the brawl he had and, you know, in the bowling alley, he gets sent to jail. But it took me a long time to understand why Alan might have acted the way he did. Mm-hmm. And um, at first we banged heads. But after a while, I think we learned to appreciate and respect each other because he knew more about me personally and I was smart enough to learn more about him. And I had people around me also that helped me, you know, in terms of dealing with Alan and getting us to understand each other and why we acted a certain way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, speaking of Alan Iverson, um, most people would like to know, in, in some regard, 
in your mind, Coach, which is a difficult question because I know, I know how you are. Um, um, who would you consider to be the best player that you've ever coached? <laughs> yeah, that, if, if you ask, if you ask Coach Smith that question, do you think he would answer that? No, he would not. <laughs> you, know, you know, you know the thing. I, I see you smiling because if we had fifteen guys on our team, um, every one of them felt they were his favorite. That's right. He treated the one through fifteen the same way. That's right. Now I know. I know if he if he might get mad at me looking down on us right now. I know who some of his favorite guys were. Right. I I do, but nobody nobody else would. He right. he wouldn't do that. I coached so many great ones that it 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 be impossible for me to tell you that. You know, I, I, I wouldn't feel right. But I'll, I'll tell you this about him. He's the greatest athlete I've ever been around. He okay. might be as great a competitor as I've ever been around. And he might be the toughest person I've ever been around. Um, if he played today, Shaman, with the way you can't touch anybody and with the way they space the floor, um, he'd average 50. You know, he, he, he just averaged 50 because you could, when we played, well, especially when I was younger and then you were playing, these guards would put a hand on you and they were so much stronger than us. They would guide <laughs> us everywhere we would go. That's I right. mean, there was, when you talk about physicality, I mean, you were playing against men now. Look at this. I, you know, I'm not taking anything away from the championship. But Hero, Robinson, and Bam were three guys that played in the finals of the NBA championships. Really terrific players. But young players. Right. They might not have even played back in the 80s and 90s. That's right. You know, they they would have waited three or four years and then probably got experience. And at the time they were ready to play, they would have gotten the minutes they deserved. And also, they would have probably went to four years of college. No question. You know, Michael, what, he went three. Kareem went four. Larry Bird went five. Yes. You know, so people don't, people don't understand that. And now you look at the NBA – you know, it's it's a different product now. There's so many younger kids playing, and if they don't play right away, they want to go somewhere else. Right. Um, and you know, I I took over nine teams in the NBA. Only one of them had a winning record, and that was Detroit. And I was lucky. I followed Carlisle. He had some really good values defensively, and. You know, Joe's whole thing, Dumars have hired me, wanted some of the younger players to play. But when he said younger players, we were talking about Tayshaun Prince, who graduated Kentucky. We were talking about Memo Okor, who played, you know, in the Euro League in Turkey. Yep. They that weren't they weren't eighteen or nineteen year old kids. Right. But but you know, and but I found out with the teams that I coached that had losing records, they either had a bad locker room where they didn't have older guys that taught young kids how to behave, how to be a pro, what values were important in order for a team to be successful, or they might not have had a great coach, or they might not have had great management. But the good teams had great coaching, great management, and great leadership in their locker room. And this is the problem I see now. These kids are leaving college so early, and college coaches are great. I mean, they're really good, and they prepare you. The longer you stay at a great program, the better chances of you having success. That's not – I'm not including LeBron. I'm not yeah. including Kevin Dar Garnett. I'm not including – Kevin Durant or people like that. Yeah, there's there's golfers that leave at 18 and 19 or tennis players 
baseball players. I get it. But the majority of kids should stay in school because, God forbid, something happens. At least they're going to get a degree. And you and I know there's life after basketball. I'm 80. I finished playing at 32. And, you know, I had so much going for me after, you know, I left Carolina, after I stopped playing. You know, you look at Kobe. Kobe played 20 years. But I think the next 20 years of Kobe's life would have been even more impactful in a positive way than even the great 20 years he had as being one of the greatest players to ever play because of the things that he was doing about champion women's basketball and doing a film and showing people, you know, there's other ways you can contribute once you're finished playing. Right. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, tell me this, Coach. Um, being one of the very few that have ever done it, and maybe the only one that has ever done it, winning the national championship and winning the NBA championship, you know, tell me which which one of those were the hardest. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm I'm the only one that's done it so far. Hopefully, there you go. Right. Hopefully that that'll happen, and I'm maybe one of the few that had a chance to do it. So maybe that's so that's probably one of the reasons that's, it happened. That's your greatness, coach. That's your greatness. Yeah. the The thing that I've found out, the hardest thing, is to make great players play as good as they're capable of playing. Mm -hmm. You know, I I I think you know the the greatest gifts you can have as a coach is bring out the very best in whoever you, you're teaching. Um, you know, some of the better teams I had and the more fun I had as a coach didn't win a championship, but every single night they played their very best. They played up to their potential. And I had more fun, I think, doing that than being around a team that was expected to win. You know, my Kansas team that won in 88, we lost our second best player to his second ACC, ACL injury. Um, we had two kids flunk out of school that were really good kids and really high quality players. They just got a little bit lax and it was probably my fault as much as any. And then we had one kid leave because of a disciplinary problem. That 88 team that won, we lost five games in a row in the middle of the season. And I told them after the fifth game, we were getting better. We were right. going to be as good as anybody. Now, I had the best player in the country in Danny Manning, which always helps. But we, I could see every single day us understanding the role – how important it was to defend, how important it was to be unselfish, how important it was for us to play harder than anybody. And then for Danny to understand, in order for us to really be great, he had to play like the best player and accept right. that responsibility. Because that was, that was really hard for him, Shaman. Mm -hmm. Then when I went to Detroit and we won, you know, we had a great team. We could really guard, but we became the best team when we got Rasheed Wallace. I'm about to ask you about him next. <laughs> yeah, well, well, you and I know, you know, whoever played with Rasheed or Coach Rasheed knows that he might have been as good a teammate as anybody ever had. That's right. Because the only thing that mattered to Rasheed was that you we won and that you did the things the way Coach expected you to do it. Um, if he scored 50 and we lost, he was terrible. He didn't like it. If we, he scored five and we won, which was very rarely that he scored five, he was the happiest guy in the world. Mm -hmm. He made everybody on our team understand the importance of communicating. He was one of the few guys that I ever coached that talked all the time. He right. made our defense better. We, we held 11 teams that year, Shaman, under 70 points. Mm. We held five teams in a row in the NBA under 70 points. 
that's never been done. They're scoring 70 and a half now. Right. Um, and we had Ben, Ben Wallace, who, you know, I, I can't believe he's not in the Hall of Fame because of the impact he had on, on the game. We had Rashid, we had Tayshawn, we had Rip Hamilton, we had Chauncey. Every one of those guys sacrificed for each other. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's why I think our game is this, when it's played the right way, it's the greatest game ever because it's if the only way you can win is if you play unselfishly and care about one another. Yeah, that's the truth. That's the truth. I wanted to get your thoughts about Rashid. You know, it, you know, he's such a, he's such a great, you know, he's, he's like my, my brother. I mean, we talk twice a week. And I know you know Miss Jackie. <laughs> Miss Jackie loves us some LB. <laughs> yeah. She's a wonderful lady. Yeah, yeah. And so, um, you know what? Give me a, a funny story about Rashid coaching him. Give me, give me a. I know you. I know you have one in the archives. Give me a funny story about old Sheed. Well, I'll give you a good one first. When he played for Coach McGuire. I mean, Coach Smith, okay. excuse me. Um, okay. Rashid, Rashid took a couple of threes in the corner on the break. And, you know, at Carolina, we had rim runners. You know, your big right. guy ran to the rim, and then you, your other big guy was a trailer at the top of the circle. And right. your first look was to throw it inside. And if you swung it to the big guy, he looked inside. And then if he didn't, he got it to the weak side. Mm -hmm. Well, Rashid came down on a break and shot a three from the corner. And you know how coach could get – coach never cursed, but ah! some, of things, <laughs> some, of the, some of the things he said to us, you thought he caught it, cursed us. <laughs> right. And he, and he said in his own way, uh, we, we, we don't shoot those shots at North Carolina, our big guys, especially, right. you know, one pass from the corner. Right. <laughs> and, and and Rashid said to coach, Coach, I can I can make that shot. And coach said, Yeah, you think you can make it? All right, you make you make ten in a row from the corner. I'll let you shoot. So he shot the first one left handed. And he's a righty and made it. And coach got all upset. Yeah, 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 yeah. And and went on. But to be honest with you, he could shoot the hell out of the ball. Plus, plus he had a great low post game. No question. And an underrated passer. And he could defend everybody. Playing today, you know, he would be what they call a stretch five or whatever. I don't even understand it. But, yeah. but he could switch ball screens and stay in front of somebody. No question. He could play. He could play strength in the pivot he'd probably front you we were all taught to front mm -hmm. and he was so quick you couldn't throw it over his head that's right and he he could shoot it up from outside he could put it on the floor and he could score in the post i'll give you another funny story when we got to the finals um when they introduced the team they put us under a canopy and when they announced your name you got on this platform in this canopy and they shine these lights on you. And then John C. Billups playing point guard for the Detroit Pistons. And then you ran out on the court. Right. Well, when they call Rashid's name, he ain't getting under that canopy. He's not, he, you know, he's just going to walk out on the court. Didn't want anybody to make a big deal of it. And then I got a call the next day from the commissioner, David Stern and said, if Rashid doesn't do that again, next game, we're going to find him $50,000. And I said, whoa. I said, you don't know Rashid, uh, Commissioner. He, he's just not like that type of guy. He said, well, everybody else is doing it. I expect him to do it. And if he doesn't, just tell him he's going to be short $50,000. Well, I went to Rashid and I said, look, Rashid, I'd rather see you donate $50,000 to your charities because he has a lot of charities. I, when we were in yeah. Detroit, when he we were in Detroit, he would get overcoats 
and heavy coats for kids in the inner cities that families couldn't afford it. Didn't want anybody to know about it. It took me two years to find out about it when he invited me to a function and I realized what he was doing, but he didn't want to bring any attention to him. So I made a deal with him. I said, here's the deal, Rashid. When they announce your name, just touch the platform and run out. And he looked at me like, coach, I don't want to do that. I said, look, Rashid, honest, just put your toe on it and run out. And they can't say anything. So he did it. Um, the next game, they didn't have the canopy anymore. He didn't get fined. <laughs> that's, that's my brother. That's yeah. my brother. Yeah, he, I mean, I, Derek Coleman and Rasheed at that position, you know, when you were playing and I was coaching, we called them power forwards because everybody had two rim protectors. Right. You know, you had, you had a center like Shaq or Akeem, you know, or Yao Ming or David Robinson. Mm -hmm. It goes on and on. But everybody had a power forward like Rasheed or, mm -hmm. you know, some low post threat, some physically tough guy like Oakley or Zach Randolph or mm -hmm. Rasheed. You know, I could go on and on about great guys look at look at the look at the Celtics front line Mikhail Parrish and Bird yes and they they were playing against you know Akeem I mean uh Jabbar James Worsley and Magic right. I mean and teams were built like that now you know you have six eight centers and yeah. no power forward and you know the three ball half the teams are taking as many threes as they are twos and coach Smith would have gone crazy he wanted us to get fouled get an offensive rebound take a high percentage shot and make sure we got back but but Rashid and Derek Coleman when I had them they were two of the most gifted talented guys at that size that I'd ever seen mm-hmm mm -hmm. they they are you know D DC man he's a He's such a, a polarizing figure as well. I mean, when you grow up seeing these guys and you finally hit the court with them, uh, you, you know, you just have so much respect. You know, like you said before, it was a different NBA. When we got to the NBA, leaving college, you know, there were men there with families. <laughs> right. So it was, it, was, it was a way, it was a, it was an order of conduct that was going to happen. And if that conduct, you know, wasn't, you know, the way it was supposed to be, those guys were going to make sure – that you understood in some form or fashion. And so, you know, you just didn't have those vets and, and things like that. So, like you said, the game has changed dramatically. Um, but, you know, the wins and losses always are, are consistent. So with that being said, um, what do you think is your greatest win? Oh, wow. Well, the I've had a lot of them to be honest with you. Um, but the greatest time I had as a coach is when coach asked me to come back to Carolina after the Olympics and be the freshman coach and assistant coach. And at mm -hmm. that time, we only had three coaches. You had the head coach, you had John Lotz and myself. Mm -hmm. And he wanted me to be the freshman coach so I would learn how to coach. Right. I used to, I used to bring in my practice plan, Shimon, Every day, you know, we always had that practice plan. You had to know the thought of the day. That's right. Remember? If yes, he sir. would question you and you didn't know the thought of the day. You were going oh, wrong. You were, in, <laughs> you were in some serious trouble. But no he, he allowed me to learn how to coach. And the amazing thing was I was just doing things that he taught me. Right. So when, when my kids went from their freshman year to the varsity, there were no drills or no terminology or no values that were going to be any different than what C Coach Smith expected of you. Right. And But I had so much fun doing it. And then, plus, there were only three coaches. And you know Coach Lotz, what an right. unbelievable human being he was. Yes. So yes. We, just, we just had an amazing, amazing group. Uh, 
to work with now, you know, um, Philadelphia, when they fired, you know, Brett Brown, mm -hmm. he had 17 coaches on his staff. Wow. Think about that. <laughs> One of my kids, you know, that I coached, Shake Milton, was on, you know, the Sixers. Mm -hmm. He told me they had 17 coaches, and most of the coaches never even got to talk to some of the players. They each were assigned a couple of guys. They were called, I don't know, developmental coaches or workout coaches. I thought we were all basketball coaches. I thought we were all supposed to teach kids how to play, how to set a screen, how to make a pass to start a play, how to get open, how to make a cut, how to keep guys in front of you, how to play one-on-one. -on -one. You know, everywhere, I'm invited everywhere, you know, colleges to watch people coach um and they asked me to kind of critique them or you know give my ideas and I'm I'm really careful about it because I don't want to make any of these guys assistants think I know any <laughs> more than they do but the majority of the coaches they asked me coach do you have a good closeout drill and I said what do you mean I know what I'm t I mean, what they mean, but I just asked them that, well, we want to run people off the three point line because we know shooting three point shots has become such a big part of the game. I said, well, why don't you spend 30 minutes a day guarding one on one, two on two, and then you don't have to worry about closing out. And they look <laughs> at me like, they look at me like I'm crazy. And I'm, and I'm saying, oh, no. That that was the way we were taught, you know. <laughs> you had to guard, right. you had to guard, guard the ball. That's and right. If you want one pass away, you had to deny the ball, make sure right. a guy caught it where he couldn't hurt you. And if you were two or three passes away, you had to be in help position help because position. Well, coach line. wanted coach wanted to make the court smaller, right? And have have the help be there if you did get beat, but. Before you got beat, you you, you to learned go. how to guard. You had to <laughs> learn how to guard one on one, or you sat your ass right down next to him. <laughs> That's right, coach. They, they they forget about one. They teaching three, but they forget about one. The first thing right. you have to defend the basketball. You, we teaching help before we teach defend. <laughs> I, I know. I know. Um, and and I I. I say that over and over again because in teaching the game, you know, I remember when I when I was with Coach McClendon, um, he had more disciples from his, you know, experience. He he coached Tennessee State when they were allowed to go in the NAIA tournament finally because no black colleges were allowed, and that was when the NAIA tournament was really really good, right. and they won three three straight years. But if you looked at all the historical black colleges, most of the coaches came from his tree. Gotcha. And and his thing when when he was teaching me to coach, you know, I went on. A, I was representing the USA team, and I went to Russia and you know Czechoslovakia and places like that with him. His whole thing was we had to learn to play three on three full court. He made that a drill every day that was the toughest thing i ever had to do in my life because playing three on three full court you're running like crazy mm -hmm. and then you got to really be able to cover somebody because there's so much room mm, that's and, right. and and we learned how to play that way and he told me that was a staple of his teaching um and his teams were always unbelievable on ball defenders mm-hmm mm-hmm yeah, that's that's a great account right there. That that makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense. Well, well, coach, you know, I, I want to ask one last question, which brings it all back to the beginning. What was your most memorable thing for yourself at the University of North Carolina? Whoa. There, there were so many of them. I know, uh, I know, Coach. I know, I know. That's 
But Most if, if I, you know, I, I could think of a lot of them. Yeah, getting, getting my degree was great because it was a struggle. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it was not easy for me because one, my interests were not totally in academics. I, I went to class just because <laughs> I wanted to be eligible to play, to be honest with you. Um, and that, that was putting, putting on that uniform was really something that was important to me because shortly after I went to Carolina, they had won the national championship in 1957, going 32-0 and and beating Will Chamberlain in triple overtime. You know, and we beat Michigan State in triple overtime in the semifinals that same year. But the greatest thing for me, to be honest, is the relationships – with the people that were connected with that program. And it started with Coach Smith and Coach Lotz and Coach McGuire. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing was when he asked me to come back and be assistant coach there with him uh, shortly after the Olympic Games, that, that to me was something that I think of all the coaching experiences I've had and they all all have been great, even though, you know, there's been some that we lost and some that I felt I could have done a better job. But being the freshman coach and the assistant coach at the University of North Carolina and working with and for Coach Smith, with Coach Lotz, I think is the, the thing that I remember most and appreciate most. That's awesome. That's awesome, Coach. Well, I'm 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 gonna say this: we are very, you know, very very um, appreciative of who you are as a person. You know, we 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 you know a lot of people can always look up the things that you've done as a coach, but you know I've always had the fond respect for you. You know, when I see you when we were recruiting, I see you out on the road. You know, I run over there with my chair. Hey, Coach, you want to sit down, baby? You know. You know, I just, uh, you know, having a lot of conversations with Coach Smith. You know, Coach Smith and I were were, were really close. And, um, you know, he always held you in high regard. And, you know, I don't think you ever – you might not remember this, but as a sophomore, you brought the Indiana Pacers to Chapel Hill for, for training camp. And uh, you let me sit and watch practice, and I would – you know, every little break I would come back, I would sit underneath the bleachers and I would watch you run practice and I would watch you, you know, tell, teach the guys, plant your inside foot when you're coming off the screen. If you didn't have a shot, then rip the basketball low below your knees and, and, and those types of things. And I got a chance to meet Reggie Miller and, and Mark Jackson and Vern, and, uh, Vern Fleming and Hayward Workman. And, and Travis, was a, uh, Travis was a rookie that year. And, uh, right. And uh, I just, I just used to sit around and just watch you and watch you guys practice. And then, you know, when I had my own time, I would go and practice those things. And that was my sophomore year. And um, doing those things in a collegiate game actually helped me a great deal. And uh, you know, people were like, well, you know, well, what changed a great deal? I don't know if it changed, but I got a lot of information you know, from pros and watching you guys and just applying it, you know, just, just, just listening and, and applying it. And uh, I don't think kids understand how important the information is and how valuable it is. And if you're willing to do the work and, 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 and be a steward of the game, it can be very beneficial uh, because after my sophomore year, I, being in the gym, uh, Coach Smith did come to me, and this is one time he said something to me that it, it just – it didn't change who I was. It didn't change how I would work. But he said to me, he said, Shimon, you know, you may want to start thinking about this as a profession because I never thought about being a professional basketball player. And so, like, even now to the day now, you know, I do teach. I teach kids basketball since I haven't gotten back into coaching, but I teach kids – uh, basketball and, you know, like even the kid Pat Williams that's supposed to be a lottery pick this year, you know, if you watch him, coach, if he doesn't have a shot, 
you watch him. He rips the basketball below his knee. <laughs> I got that from you. <laughs> Indiana Pacers, <laughs> 1996, <laughs> you know, and so, you know, just, just those things alone, it says, hey, you know what? The game hasn't changed. It's the teaching of the game that has changed. And those who are willing to go and get that wisdom from guys like yourself and be able to apply it and articulate it to others will benefit them dramatically. Because I have Pat Williams, then I have two other kids in this, you know, the top top 50 in America this year, I have another kid in 2023 that's top 25 in the country. And I'm teaching them things <laughs> that I've learned, of course, over time, but I understood why you said rip the basketball through the defense. I understood plant the inside foot. I under, you know, those things that you were teaching in 1996 are, are the things that I teach today that, that, that help these kids excel. So, you know, not, not only well, am I grateful, they are, they are grateful as well. Well, I didn't want to interrupt you, but you were a gym rat. <laughs> you know, you know, there's a lot of guys, you know, I tell kids this all the time. God, God gives you the gift of talent. But character is a choice. Yeah. And, and, you know, guys that work the hardest at their craft, even though they may not be the most gifted, generally show the most improvement. Mm -hmm. And if you are a good athlete and are gifted and are a gym rat and have an open mind and accept coaching as coaching and not criticism, the sky's the limit for you. And then it's no surprise that those are the guys that go the furthest. And it's also a quality in life because if things come easy to you, it's a false sense of really what the way things are. You know, adversity is part of part of life and it's how you deal with it. That's why I always loved Coach Smith. He might get on you in practice. And it wasn't criticism, it was coaching. He was teaching you. But you never heard him say a negative word in a game. Right. Unless unless you were selfish or acted stupid. Mm -hmm. But otherwise it wasn't about time. It wasn't, it wasn't about score, who was winning. Everything that he was talking about is positive stuff that can make you do your job better. Um, and and the, the thing that we all know, and you're dealing with young kids, once you develop their trust and they know they, that you care about them, you got them. That's right. You got them. And, and it's not an easy thing. You, you said it as, you know, especially with the way the world is now. Mm -hmm. um, but once they know you care about them and you trust and they trust you, they want to be coached because there right. is some insecurity in all of us, no matter how talented mm -hmm. we are. And, and I, I know you've done it a great job in, in that regard. And, you know, that's why when you, when you look at the programs you've been with and the kids that you've impacted, you know, you're going to have a legacy now. I'm just hoping that somebody's smart enough to hire your ass and share what you and I know, you know, I'm dying to, you know, get with some NBA team and be like Tex Winter was or Johnny Bach or, Pete Carell when they were older and share what I was taught. But mm -hmm. I don't know if that's in the cards. And so I'm just going to go around and watch people coach and smell the gym and, you know, keep our friendship up. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, well, coach, I'm, I'm, I'm extremely grateful to have you, man. It's not, it's not often where people can get somebody of your magnitude to, to participate. And that just shows the, the person you are, man. And, I'm very thankful. We, you know, the Carolina contingent is very thankful to have you as one of ours. And, uh, and uh, you know, a lot of us, you know, like I said before, we hold you in high regard because you are the godfather. And uh, <laughs> we, we, we appreciate everything that you've done, we've done for us. And, uh, and God permitting, you know, you'll have an opportunity to get back into the coaching 
uh, aspect as you wish. Um, but I do know this, if your time permits, there's somebody right up the street from you two hours that's coaching at Jordan High School <laughs> that you I know. <laughs> hey, it's amazing going to watch Rashid coach, man. <laughs> that temperament, man, I love it. I said, man, I never thought that you'd be this, this temp you know, your temperament, man, is just stupendous. I've never seen you be yeah. relaxed. <laughs> well, Dave, Dave Hanners and Phil Ford and I have talked about, you know, going up and seeing him because I love that guy. And uh, I think just like I said about you, the kids that you're impacting, Rashid's going to have the same impact on their lives. You know, it's, it's going to be fun. It's going to be fun to do it. So. Yeah. Maybe you and I'll meet up there at the same time and laugh together. Anytime. If, and if I need to come and get you on the way, I don't mind coming by and picking you up and bringing you back. I'll, I'll look forward to that, Shimon. Yeah, I don't have that problem. You, all right. You stay safe. I love you, son. Yeah, love you too, Coach. Thank you so much, man.